Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're delighted that you're here. And this morning, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what you're growing, what you're growing in your garden. We talked last week uh, about Easter, and we talked about Easter time coming at this at this incredible time of the year when, when all of nature is coming back to life. It's just, it's just absolutely amazing. We were out working in the yard for a couple of days this week, and it seems like there's not, a, there's not a spot of earth anywhere that nature isn't doing something with. It isn't cultivating in some way. Now, of course, we may look at that and say there are weeds that are popping up, but to nature they're perfect. They're a perfect expression of the condition of that soil at that time. But the point is, is that nature will be expressed. It will push forward. It will, it will do whatever it needs to do or has to do. I mean, tiny little cracks in the, in the concrete have blades of grass growing out of it. The power of nature is just amazing. I grew up in a, uh, a beach area where we had a lot of salt marsh and sand, and people would come and try to put uh, blacktop pavement down over the, over the sand. They would make roads in the sand. You know, uh, you've seen these at the beach areas. And what would happen is, is that over time, the little blades of sea oats would come up through the asphalt. They were so tenacious. There was something in them that was just, just so determined to live that they would push up from the sand, which, which if you look at beach sand, you say, how can anything in the world grow in that? You know, it's just mostly salt, it looks like. But yet the sea oats were perfectly adapted and they were they were kind of hollow, you know. They look like straw when they dry out. And they were kind of hollow, and they were able to just push their way up through the asphalt and slice their way through. It's just amazing. So we're looking we're looking at this time of the year when everything is coming back to life, and we're looking at this as a metaphor, as a reminder of our spiritual growth. We talked about the death and the resurrection as reminding us that there comes a time in our spiritual growth where, where you know, perhaps for years or we, we've, we go through life and we know that there's something else there. We know that there's a presence there. We know that there's, there's a love there. And we really want to be closer to it and we want to explore it more. But we're very, very busy. We're very, very busy with our lives. You know, we're raising children. We're... We're, we're building careers, we're going to work, we're going to school, we're doing all these things. And sometimes it's like, well, we'll get to that later, we'll get to that later. But there comes a time when that seed of the spiritual truth that's within us, that presence of the divine, we're like the seal, it, it, it's going to push through, it's going to come through, and there's nothing that's going to be able to stop it. Emma Curtis Hopkins called it the inevitableness of God, and I love I love that term. You know, <laughs> whenever you think that there's a tough, tough problem to be solved, think of the inevitableness of God. Think of the unstoppable nature of the omnipotence of the universe. What could possibly get in God's way? What could possibly prevent the divine from from pushing through? And absolutely nothing can do that. So there is within us the very seed of, of our spiritual nature. It is the essence of who and what we are. I of my own self can do nothing, but there's something within me that can. I don't know how to, how to breathe and take oxygen out of the air and put carbon dioxide back into it, but there's something within me that does. There's a wisdom and an intelligence that knows how to function perfectly on this plane of existence. And there's this, this desire within us. I mean, life kind of leads us by desires. And I, and I know that desire is often used as kind of a, 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 a bad thing. But we have to, <coughs> excuse me, we have to understand that desire itself is not a bad thing. Our desires can lead us uh, into, into a greater expression of life, into a greater experience of God. So, for example, our bodies need water. You know, it is a necessary uh, element of life. If we don't drink water, we will die within just a couple of days. You know, our bodies need air. If we don't breathe, we will be dead in just a few minutes. Our bodies need food. <clears throat> if we don't eat, you know, we'll be dead in, in a month or so. So nature gives us the urge to engage in those activities that are essential 
for our expression of life and for the, for the maintenance of our life. It, it gives us thirst. It gives us, it gives us hunger. It gives us the desire to breathe and the abundance of air so plentiful that we don't, we don't even consciously breathe. You know, we consciously drink and we consciously eat, but we don't consciously breathe. We just do it. It's just there. The lungs go in, the lungs go out, and we breathe. And in the same manner that, that these desires to engage in those activities that are beneficial for life are already born within us. Right? We didn't put them there. We didn't have to be taught uh, how to be hungry. Right? You take a newborn child, the instance is born, and it, it wants to suckle. It's just it's pre-programmed. It is just an, an essential part of its nature. And in our nature, we have an essential part to seek communion with the divine, to seek the experience of the presence of God. We didn't put it there. Aquinas tells us that uh, we wouldn't even have the desire to pray if God hadn't first put it in our heart. There is, there is something within us that causes us to seek, and we're not entirely certain what it is that we're seeking for. We don't know, you know, it's just, but, but we're seeking, we're seeking. And we go through life doing that. And, and sometimes, inevitably for all of us, we look in the wrong places. We get engaged in the wrong things. We, we think that we'll find that fulfillment if we just throw ourselves into our career. And, and then we find out that, no, that, that wasn't it. Or, or we throw ourselves into something else. And, no, that wasn't it. And we have to keep searching and we have to keep seeking. And what that is, is that is the love of God calling us home, calling us to itself, if you will. Meister Eckhart says God is like the person who plays hide-and-seek and then clears its throat so we will find it. There is that within us which is calling us to itself. And at some point in our development, at some point in, in the development of our soul, as we become more and more <clears throat> serious about it, I guess, or we're more and more focused on it, perhaps is a better word than serious, we start to recognize that a change is necessary. That we have to stop living our lives in the old way of the world. And we have to start living our lives in the new, the new spiritual way. We have to start acting like the spiritual beings that we know ourselves to be. There must be a death and a resurrection. We must throw off the old Adam. And Adam meant clay man, by the way, man of the earth. It meant that it meant that we were created from the dust of the earth. And the Bible tells us to throw off the old and to put on the new. And if we stop and think about that, it is it is literally true that our bodies are the dust of the earth. And we put we put the seed in the ground, and the seed becomes the fruit and the vegetables that we eat, and they become our very body. And what is that but the dust of the earth that has changed form several times? And that has become the very bodies that we that we use while we are here. And when we go around in dust, you know, <laughs> dust with the with the, the feather duster, what are we taking off the furniture? But our old bodies. So we're constantly slowly throwing off the old. But, but what we're talking about is almost like a step a step function where we jump up to a new level where we are born again, if you will, born again into our spiritual nature. So that's what we were talking about, and we want to look this week at your garden. What are you growing? Because a garden is the perfect metaphor for the growth of our soul. It's kind of interesting that in our culture, in this Western world, the Judeo-Christian background, if you call it that, <clears throat> and even even uh, uh, even other religions of the book Islam, um, we have the garden. We have the garden, and life begins in the garden. And the, and the experience that we are told in the garden is one of peace is one of tranquility, is one of perfect harmony. I mean, think about that, living in a lush a lush garden, <coughs> excuse me, especially for a culture of people 
who lived in a desert, right? Because these these stories come to us from the Mesopotamia area. These people lived in very, very harsh conditions. So you can imagine what cool water and cool shade and a lush tropical garden, you can imagine the symbolism that that holds for these people who who were raised in some of the harshest conditions. And yet the metaphor of the journey of the soul starts off in the garden, where we are in that garden. And it is just natural for us to be in the presence of of God. And people walk hand in hand with the Lord, is what we're told. Adam and Eve walk hand in hand. And everything is at peace and everything is at harmony. And we left that, of course, we left that experience to go into the world to develop our uniqueness, to develop our our unique understanding and our unique, unique perspective to become individualized expressions of God. But I don't want to take it that we were thrown out as a punishment, the typical explanation. We left. We left of our own free will. We left to go have the experience of good and the experience of evil. We left because it was necessary for us to develop our individuality. But we are on our way back. See, we are on our way back. As Judy Collins tells us in the song, you know, we've got to make our way back to the garden. That's that's what our life is about. That's what the journey of our soul is about. And that's why the metaphor of the garden is so powerful. So Dr. Holmes tells us to consider the soil. He uses the soil quite a lot in his teaching. And he uses the soil to represent the what he calls the power of soul, the creative force of the universe, or the law of mind. That there is a creative medium in the universe. There's this creative soil. And we can take a seed and we can put the seed into that soil. And there's something that happens between the seed and the soil. There's an interaction. And the soil provides to the seed the nourishment it needs. The soil knows what to do, so to speak, in order to allow that seed to grow in the manner in which it needs to grow, to become that which it must become. So if we put a tomato seed in the ground, the soil nurtures it and gives us a tomato plant. If we put a cucumber seed in the ground, the soil nurtures it and gives us a cucumber plant. But never, ever do we put a tomato seed in the soil and the soil says back to us, no, I'm not going to give you tomatoes. I'm going to give you cucumbers because that's what I think you need best. He uses the soil as an example of a blind creative force of nature. That which is intelligent, that which knows what to do, that which knows how to do it, but it does not know why it is doing it. It doesn't question why. It doesn't change why. It doesn't have will or volition, but it has intelligence. It has power. It has ability. And what we... What we want to consider then is is that what you and I are doing, what we are doing as we are going through life and as we are as we are kind of evolving into our purpose of life, our purpose of life being to awaken to our spiritual nature, to discover the presence of God, not only within us, but within all persons <clears throat> everywhere present. That as we go through life and and we are in the process of awakening to our spiritual nature, as we are in the process of of moving towards the death and resurrection, the death of of the idea of the mortal person, and the resurrection being the embracing of the idea of the spiritual person, that as we are doing that, it's very much like cultivating our gardens. That what we are doing is is we are taking the seed, which is our thought, our intention, our desires, <coughs> our desire to know God, our desire to know love, our desire to be loving and peaceful, to know health, not just for ourselves, but for all of humanity. Right? Emerson tells us it doesn't do us a bit of good if we're going to pray for some good for ourselves that we would not will to each and every other person. 
because we are one. See, we are one. How can I, how can I, how can I want or declare something for myself that I would withhold from another? You can't do that. You can't, you can't give with one hand or <clears throat> receive with one hand and, and withhold from the other. Life's a game of boomerangs. What you give out, you're going to get back. So what we are doing as we are going through life and as we are slowly awakening, for many of us it's a slow process. For some it can happen spontaneously. But as we, as we very deliberately and very consciously embark on our path of spiritual growth, what you want to consider is it's like planting different seeds in your garden. It's like planting those seeds and letting them sprout. So we plant the seed of love. And we plant it. And our desire is for a greater experience of love, the presence of unity, uh, the experience of unity, excuse me, the presence of the divine in ourselves and in all persons. And we let that, we let that seed sprout. There's something in the soil, the creative soil of the universe, the law of mind, the soul of the universe. There's something there that knows how to produce within our consciousness whatever change or changes as needs must be for that greater experience of love. And perhaps we want to sow the seed of health and to know perfect health and perfect harmony for every cell in our body, every organ, every tissue, every function. And there's that which created these bodies out of the dust of the earth, and it certainly knows how to maintain them. You know, it would be incomprehensible to think that the intelligence of the universe, the intelligence of God, knows how to take the sperm and the egg and out of, the, out of that produce these magnificent bodies that we have but doesn't know how to take care of them, doesn't know how to heal them. Can't happen. Frederick Bale says that, that the, the life and the love and the presence of God that created these bodies in the womb did not leave and abandon us the moment we were born. It is still here. It is still ready, it is still willing, and it is still able to function as right action, as harmony, and as health. The difference is now we have to cooperate consciously. In the womb, we cooperated unconsciously. But now we have the ability to choose, to think, to decide. And we must learn to consciously cooperate with the power for good that is within us. So if you think about, <coughs> excuse me, planting your vegetable garden or your flower garden for the year, you know, there's certain steps that you go through. And if you think about your spiritual growth, you can, you can kind of identify with the steps of building your garden. So the first thing that you have to do if you're going to have a garden is you have to decide. You have to plan. What kind of a garden are you going to have? Where are you going to have it? Are you going to grow flowers or are you going to grow vegetables? And if you're going to go f- grow flowers, what kind of flowers are you going to grow? Are you going to grow flowers that come up every year? Or are you going to grow flowers that just just kind of bloom and fade and then you have to pull them out and put something else in? You have to make a decision. I remember <clears throat> when when our kids were little and, and uh, the seed catalogs were paper, they used to come and they were they were huge. They were huge pieces of paper. They were an odd size, I think, to get your attention. They were probably like uh, uh, 10 inches wide by 14 inches high or something unique like that with lots of colors, lots lots of colors. And, of course, every seed that they advertised was uh, was better than the next. You know, it was, just, it was just absolutely fantastic. And we would sit there for hours with the little ones on our lap, and we would be looking at the different the different pictures and say, oh, let's look at those watermelons. Should we grow watermelons like that? Or let's look at those pumpkins. Should we grow pumpkins like that? And they would have a a ball, and we would have a ball as a family kind of trying to decide together what it was that we were going to plant in our garden that year. What kind of garden were we going to have? And then the seed company had something very interesting. They They had a jumble packet, they called it. It was for children, and it was a penny. And the children had a, it had to be a penny cash that they had to put, put in there. And they had to make their mark or sign their name if they were old enough to sign their name. But if the children would do that, then the seed company would send them a jumble packet. And it was just a big envelope of 
God knows what was in there. You just unless you were you were good and you could look at the seeds and you could say, oh, I, I recognize that. I know what kind of seed that is. Uh, it was really anybody's guess as to what was in there. And the kids would love to go out and they had their little patch and they would put put their seeds from a jumble packet in and they'd watch all these different things come out of the ground and, and try to discover what they are. Well, unless we decide, unless we consciously choose what it is that we wish to experience in life, what it is that we wish to have in our garden, unless we choose, it's kind of like taking that jumble packet and scattering on the ground in the garden of your life and then just taking whatever comes along. Now, whatever comes along may be wonderful, it may be beautiful, uh, it may be interesting to look at, but there's no thought, there's no planning involved. And if we wish to grow, if we wish to, if we wish to grow our soul <clears throat> to experience a deeper level, the presence of God, it might be better for us if we decide this year I'm growing love because, because growing love in my experience is going to help me to greater experience God. This year I am growing peace. This year I am growing health. This year I am growing prosperity. This year I am coming to know the very power and the presence and the activity of God in a very specific and intimate way. I am planting something very specific in my consciousness. So the first thing we've got to decide is what you're growing. What you're growing. What do you want to grow this year? Do you want to grow peace? Do you want to grow love? You want to grow health? You want to grow prosperity? You want to grow perfect right activity? You want to grow love and relationships? What's on there? You can have more than one, but do you know what it is that you want? Or do you just want to get the jumble packet and toss it out and see what happens and see what comes up? The choice is yours. The choice is yours to make. But the first step in planning your garden is, is you have to decide. You have to decide what it is that you want. <clears throat> Keep in mind that just as, as a weed is, is the absolute perfect plant for those soil conditions at that time, that if we don't choose to cultivate our consciousness, to cultivate our soul, then the the experiences that we have in life are the perfect expressions of our consciousness at that time. So whatever we get, whatever we get in life, if we do not choose consciously, whatever we get is a perfect reflection of what we believe. It's done unto us according to our belief. Now that's good because we can look at what's going on in our life and say, what what do I have to believe in order for that to make sense, in order for that to be a perfect demonstration. Or we can decide <clears throat> to change the soil conditions. We can try to cultivate. We can decide to change. So what we do if we go out to plant our garden is, is we till the soil. We go in there and we stir things up. We go in there and we turn under uh, all of the things that we don't want. We turn down the weeds. We turn down the grass. We break up the clods, the big, the big chunks of, of our obstacles, if you will, our negative thinking. We have to kind of, we have to kind of shake all of that up and shake all of that loose and, and kind of prepare the ground for our seeds. Right? And this is our spiritual practice in our spiritual life. This is what we are doing when we are doing our, our affirmative prayer, our treatment, when we are doing uh, our meditation, and, and particularly when we are doing our affirmations. You know, when we are affirming something, it's going down into our subconscious, and it is shaking up the belief system in there. Anything that disagrees with that is going to kind of push back. It's going it to kind of grit its teeth and shake a little bit. So what we're doing when we are doing our spiritual practice when we are doing our treatment, our affirmative prayer, when we are doing our meditation, when we are reading and doing our education and taking in new ideas, when we are doing our affirmation, what we are doing is we are cultivating 
the ground. We are cultivating the soil of our soul. We are, we are turning under and turning away the things that we no longer want. We are breaking up the clods of negative thinking, of old habitual thinking. We are breaking that up with our, with our affirmations. When we are doing our treatment, we are setting into motion the power of the universe that responds to us according to our belief, and we are directing it to help us to release and let go of whatever we need to release and let go of. Right? Don't ever lose sight of the fact that we don't have to do it all by ourselves. What we have to do is we have to decide and we have to set the law in motion. So if you were at the top of the ski slope and you rolled up a little snowball and you started pushing it down the hill, you don't have to run with it all the way down the hill and push it and make it get bigger and bigger and bigger. Right? The laws of the universe, the law of gravity, the law of attraction, <coughs> all work. And as that snowball rolls down the hill pushed by gravity or pulled by gravity, as it starts to roll down the hill, it attracts more and more and more and more snow to it until the time it gets to the bottom of the hill. It's huge. And it's moving quickly. But you didn't have to run with it the whole way. You had, to, you had to know what it was that you wanted to do. And you had to get things started. And this process of changing our consciousness, cultivating the soil of our consciousness for our spiritual growth, is kind of the same. We don't, we don't have to go in there and, and consciously go in and dig up every weed of negative thinking. We don't have to go in there and say, well, gee, when, when did I get that old idea and who gave that to me? And maybe I was five years old and I was at a birthday party and somebody said something mean and all of that. We don't have to do that. That's psychoanalysis. That's, that's <clears throat> psychology. And that, that is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not what we're doing here. What we're doing here is, is we are deciding what changes we want to take place in the garden of our soul, and we are setting in motion the law that knows how to do that, the power that knows how to do that. In traditional theology, we're setting free the Holy Spirit, the doer of the word, to come in and make whatever change or changes as needs must be in our consciousness. So we've decided what we want to plant in our garden this year. We want love. We want peace. We want health. We want prosperity. We want fulfilling activities. We want spiritual growth. And we want that not just for our own selves, but for each and every person who wants them as well. We accept that for each and every person. We've gone through the seed catalog of spiritual qualities, of virtues, if you will, and we've decided which ones we should have. What we're going to grow this year, what you're growing, what we're going to work on this year. And we have taken that into our prayer life, into our meditation where we can meditate on love and we can meditate on peace. And we've taken that into our affirmations where we we can declare that the love of God and the peace of God is right here and right now and let those affirmations go down into the subconscious and shake loose anything that doesn't agree with them so that that old belief can let go. We have set into motion the power of the universe that responds to us according to our belief, allowing it to go in and do more work below our level of consciousness to do more work to make whatever change or changes as needs must be. So we've tilled the soil. We've planted our seeds, the seeds that we've chosen to plant, what we have decided to experience this year. And now we must tend the garden. And a couple things come with that. The first is we have to trust. We have to know that the soil and the seed together know exactly what to do. Yeah, I don't know what to do. I mean, you can give me a, a, a bean and I can hold it in my hand forever and I wouldn't know how to make it sprout. You know, But I don't know if you ever did this when you were kids where you, you put a little bean into a, a glass jar and you put a piece of blotter in there and, and some water on it and that bean knows how to grow it knows how to sprout we used to <clears throat> take them out they'd start to sprout up and we'd take them out and turn them upside down so the sprout was going down and in a couple of days that sprout would turn and it would just be going right back up when uh, we had grapevines at one one point one of our properties 
and every once in a while you'd have to go out and you'd have to um, you'd have to tie the vines to the trellis. And in the process of doing that, many of the leaves would get turned upside down. Yeah, and you could tell which ones were upside down. They're kind of gray or silver on the bottom and green on the top. But they would get turned upside down, and you'd look the next day, and they'd all be right side up. See, there's something, there's an intelligence there that knows what to do. And there's an intelligence in the soil and the seed that knows what to do. And we don't doubt it. We don't question it. You know, We don't go out every day to dig up that seed to see if it's, if it's sprouting. We don't go out every day to, to, to turn over the potatoes to see if anything's happening. We know that there's an intelligence in the universe that knows what to do with that seed when we put it in the ground. And we have to know the same, that when we take the seed of our intention, of our declaration, of our treatment, our positive prayer, when we take that and we put that into the creative medium of the universe, we have to trust that there's an intelligence there that knows exactly what to do. So we don't ever wonder if it's working. We may wonder how it's working. We may, we may joyfully expect, <laughs> expect it to show up in our lives. But we don't ever have to doubt, well, gee, maybe that's not working because it must be working. And if we think that it's not working, it, it works by not working. It sounds like double talk, but it's done unto us according to, we believe, to our belief. If we believe it's not, then it's not. If we believe it is, then it is. So the first thing we have to do is trust. We have to let it go. We have to put it in the, in the ground. We have to cover it over with the right amount of dirt. We put a little bit of water on it, and we let it go. We let it go, knowing that there's a power in the universe that is smarter than we are, that is taking care of everything. And then what we do is, is, is we remain vigilant you know, to, to weeds coming in, negative thoughts, uh, doubts, if you will, uh, old ways, old beliefs. And in this manner, what happens is every minute of every day is an opportunity for us to, to continue to weed our garden. So Emmett Fox says you have to change your mind and you have to keep it changed. And what happens to us a lot is we change our mind and then 15 minutes later we go right back to the old way of thinking or believing. You know, so we're, we're, <clears throat> we decide, for example, this year that what we want is, is, is we want peace and harmony. That's, that's what we want to see in the world. We want peace and harmony. And we do our spiritual practice for peace and harmony. And we bring ourselves to, in our prayer to a, a beautiful place of feeling that the peace and harmony already exists, that it's already here, that it is coming up through us, that we accept it, that we release and we let go of every and any idea within us that is not peaceful or harmonious. And we go to work and somebody says something to us and boom, <clears throat> we've lost our peace and harmony. We are back into the old defensive attack mode <laughs> getting mad and, and why is this this person doing this to me and all that and that's a wonderful opportunity for us to be aware see to be aware of what we're doing and to stop and say nope 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 that was the old way of doing things that was the old way of thinking and i don't believe that way anymore and i don't think that way anymore and i'm going to take that weed and i'm going to cancel it i'm going to throw that weed out of my garden so what we do is, is, is we just remain vigilant. We re- remain aware and conscious of what we're thinking. If we ever feel <coughs> excuse me, the need to treat again, we do what Emmett Fox says, we treat the treatment. What we do is, is we treat ourselves to know that we've already done the prayer and the prayer is already working, and we treat ourselves to know that. We don't have to, we don't have to make it work again. We just have to accept the fact that it's working. So just as, just as nature in due time, when we cooperate with the way that she works, when we till the soil, make our decisions, <clears throat> plant our seeds, weed and care for our garden, <laughs> continue, continue to, to tenderly uh, care for, for our plants, we water them, we give them food, we do the same, we do the same with our, our uh, prayers. When we sit and we meditate and we contemplate God's love and God's peace, we kind of we kind of fertilize, if you will, the seed that's growing within us. But just as we care for our garden, and eventually it must give us the very things that we have given to it, as we care for the garden of our soul, it blooms. It blooms. The 
very love that we decided that we <clears throat> we should have and would have flows through us and to us. The very peace that we declared was already there is more visible in our lives. The health, the prosperity, the fulfilling activities, the life we start to lead becomes more reflective of our spiritual nature than of our human nature. And in that manner, we start to blossom. We start to blossom into that beautiful, beautiful expression of God that we are. In the East, they use the lotus, <clears throat> the lotus blossom as a metaphor for spiritual growth. Lotus blossom is a beautiful, beautiful flower. And it grows on top of the nastiest places. It floats on the stagnant waters. And it puts its tentacles or its roots, they hang down into the pond. And there's something within that flower, there's something within it itself that knows how to take <clears throat> that dust of the earth, if you will, that, that muck of the earth, that slime, that, that which doesn't smell too well. And it knows how to take that, and it knows how to transform that into one of the most beautiful and fragrant flowers. There is that within us that we did not create and we did not put here, but there is that within us that knows how to take all of the experiences of our lives, even the ones that may not seem so pretty, and it knows how to take that and allow it to blossom into the beautiful expression of of God that we are. So I invite you then <clears throat> to trust this week and to think this week about what you're growing. What you're growing. What is the crop that you want to reap in the fall? As you sow, you shall reap. What is it you want to reap in the fall? When we come to the end of this year together, do you want to feel... <clears throat> more loving and loved, more peaceful, healthier, wealthier, more fulfilled, more generous. <laughs> How is it that you want to wet, let <clears throat> this beautiful expression of life, of God that is you, how is it that you want it to express itself this year? The choice is yours. You have the ability to choose, and you have the responsibility, which means you must. You have the accountability, which means that you will be held accountable in terms of what, <clears throat> what you get back is what you give out. So it's a beautiful time of the year. Life all around us <clears throat> is giving us a message. Grow, grow, live, express, let the beauty come forth. You have the seed catalog of your soul in front of you on your lap. You can decide any way at all. And, and nature and life and the universe will support you in whatever decision you make. The creative medium of the soul does not judge you. It always says yes. So pick out your seeds of love. Pick out your seeds of health. Pick out your seeds of prosperity, of joy, of fulfillment, and of spiritual attunement. Go and cultivate the soil of your soul with your treatment, your meditation, your affirmations, your education. Plant your seeds. Cover them over and let them go. 
let the love of God that has created this entire universe out of itself do what needs to be done in order to produce whatever change or changes as needs must be within your consciousness so that the avenue for the answered prayer can be opened within you. And then when we get together at harvest time, when we come together at Thanksgiving and we stop and count our blessings, we can realize together that what we are counting is that which we have sown, which we have cultivated, which we have cared for. You are that beautiful, beautiful flower that the love of God has put here to bloom. Let this be the year that you decide to blossom. And so it is.